Hello and welcome back to Miss Anna Loves Grammar. In this video I want to concentrate on the tragic figure of Desdemona. Now across the play here are some of the adjectives we could throw at her character. She is brave at the start of the play, standing up to the Duke. She is loyal to her husband, even against her better judgement later on in the play. She is all throughout seen as a loving character. Her virtues are clear. She's regularly depicted as pure, but ultimately in the name of being a loving wife, she ends up being a tragic figure who's smothered to death with a pillow by her husband. Now, I want to encourage you to hit subscribe to join my tribe for all things English literary and grammatical, but let's get into it by examining a little bit more closely how those attributes come to life with the evidence we have before us. This is a particular use for you if you want to be writing an essay around Desdemona, but also if you're thinking of the themes of love as they play out between her and her tragic marriage to Othello. The depiction of Desdemona as naive and pure is highlighted by so many characters, all male I hasten to add. Her father in Act 1, Scene 3 describes her as a maid and never bold, implying her meekness and dare I say in line with expectations of a woman in uh, that society. But then Cassio bombards high praise for Desdemona at various moments across the play. He describes her as a maid that Paragon's description and wild fame. Now, we recognise through his relationship with Bianca that this does not mean that he fancies Desdemona, but she's once again seen as full of virtue. Paragon's description and wild fame. Equally, he describes her as an exquisite lady, that adjective exquisite accentuating all the virtue she has and that purity of spirit. He even describes her later as the divine Desdemona, such a spiritual overhang of heavenly purity. And if we see Desdemona as a heavenly force, um, it's accentuated further uh, by later events that unfold at the hands of the uh, somewhat hellish vi villain in the form of Iago. But later we see as well Cassio remain with this sense of a most fresh and delicate creature. So in all senses, she is perceived as pure. And that's what makes Iago all the more the villain when he says in his soliloquy in Act 2, Scene 1, now I do love her too. And what he means by that is he feels threatened by Othello having uh, leapt in his seat. So now he loves Desdemona as a form of revenge to heighten his sense of villainy. If you like, she is the innocent victim of Othello's misdirected passion in a cruel, selfish, destructive world. And she represents selfless love here. She's inexperienced in the ways of the world. She's initially frightened. Um, she is in many ways at the hands of men and her inexperience is what leads to her downfall. Here are several events that prove how unworldly Desdemona is and why she's so easily exploited because of her innocence. Iago in Act 2, Scene 3, when he says, and out of her goodness make the net that shall enmesh them all, it's this real sense of, oh good, she is the reason why this will come together nicely, because she's so unaware. Equally though, the question that Desdemona asks Amelia in Act 4, Scene 3, that she cannot fathom the idea that a woman could be unfaithful, you know, that they could abuse their husbands in such gross kind, it proves how little she knows of the world. But equally, her way of navigating in Act 3, Scene 3, her support for Cassio, who she believes has been mistreated, when she says, uh, in quite an annoying and intrusive way to her husband, um, but shall it be shortly? Shall it be tonight? At supper? Tomorrow? Dinner then? It's so impetuous, it's so irritating, and it's actually a really disrespectful way of intruding on her husband's professional judgement. The fact she narrates that moment as if Cassio is a suitor strikes quite an ominous tone for us as it definitely has a double meaning and it definitely accentuates this sense that her judgment is clouded by just her own opinion. She has no other um, experience to dwell on and that inexperienced perception is also echoed by the way in which she and Othello are blinded by love for each other at the start of this play. 
the romantic depths of courage and loyalty that are created because of how much Desdemona is blinded by her love for Othello are made clear. In Act 1, Scene 3, she defends her love for Othello in front of the senators, and she says, my heart's subdued even to the utmost pleasure of my lord. It's so intense. Equally, this way that she describes herself as a moth if she was to be without him and demands that she goes to Cyprus with him. She is young and romantic, and when she describes how she saw um, Othello's visage in his mind, and to his honours and his valiant parts did I my soul and fortunes consecrate, we get this deep and intense sense that she cannot see there is more to Othello than his utter devotion, and loyalty blinds her to that reality. The foundation of their marriage is not strong and it therefore makes sense that when we encounter them in their full, full on passion in Act 1, Scene 3, that we are about to see the tragic fall of their marriage through the challenges they are about to face so new into this dynamic relationship together. The central flaw of Desdemona in her marriage lies at the heart of her being immature. She relies too heavily on Othello's love for her. She's stubborn and tactless and we know how Iago will twist her words and we know Othello is less than perfect by this point and she's not aware of that at all. Iago has fueled all sorts of drama by Act 3, Scene 3, and so when Othello says, I will refuse you nothing, this comes at a time when he does not love her. He says, chaos is come again. There's a prophetic element to this, and this sense of danger in his words is very clear to us as an audience. There's a very clear sense of emotional blackmail at play, reinstating that Cassio is proof of Othello's love for her. Um, and actually, this is both tactless and very imperceptive of the emotions that Othello is conveying to her. Act 3, scene 3 is not the hinge scene that we know it to be for nothing other than Desdemona moving from being active to passive. She lies about the handkerchief. More than anything, she refuses to see Othello's jealousy and excuses his behaviour. Othello stopped listening. It's when we start realising how fatal this marriage is because their communication is terrible. Instead of listening to his wife, Othello begins to listen to Iago instead. This is a huge sense of a uh, shift for us because this temptation scene offers for us how uh, she is misguided in her thinking. She thinks she can tame Othello. She famously says in Act 3, Scene 3, his bed shall seem a school, his board a shrift. She's teasing Othello and is able to hold her own in verbal battles with Iago, but we know this will be short-lived. We also have to accept that the change afoot is about to accentuate the tragedy of their marriage. Desdemona as a tragic figure is made clear to us through the contrast we encounter of her in Act 3, Scene 3 and onwards. She lies about the handkerchief and actually this contrasts the woman we encountered in Act 1, Scene 3 who was very clear in expressing her views in front of the Senate. Actually, she seems completely at sea about Othello's jealousy. She says, I never saw this before. She's bewildered by this. She says, my lord, are you wise? What, is he angry? This kind of sense that she's unable to fathom his anger means that she's completely at a loss in acknowledging the facts that her relationship is crumbling and instead this fuels Othello's belief that their relationship was based on lies from the start. When he hits her in Act 4 scene 1 she meekly takes the blame. She says I'll, I'll not stay to offend you but retains her composure, her dignity. She says I've not deserved this. Othello Hitting Desdemona is a really brutal and significant act of humiliation for her. This is in front of Ludovico and the senators. And he seems so brutal in his dismissal of Desdemona. He says, yeah, sir, she can turn and turn and yet go on. She's obedient, as you say, very obedient. And so the desperation is made clear to us in Act 4, Scene 2, when Desdemona seeks out Iago for advice. What shall I do to win my lord again, she says. And she refers to Iago as a good friend against that juxtaposition of what we know him to be, a villain. He is perceived by all these characters as good. It adds to her tragic element. That sense by the end of Act 4 that she sees her death is close when she asks Amelia to put wedding sheets on the bed. It's as if we rekindle that sense of love that she hopes she can find with Othello again in the early days of their marriage. She tells Amelia, if I do 
die before thee, prithee shroud me in one of these sheets. We realise this is the beginning of the end for her. This is Desdemona's final line. Nobody, I myself, is her belief as to why she must die. This is in response to Othello demanding, think on your sins. And she says, loves I bear to you. She's ruined by her desire to be innocent and good. And she realises far too late that innocence will not save her. Her cry of despair on hearing of Cassio's death is misinterpreted by Othello. And he believes she must be murdered. And he even says, then heaven have mercy on me. But we know this will be greeted with regret. It's so ironic that her decision to lie in her marital bed is thought to save her and keep her pure. Because we know that this is the place she'll be smothered. This is the place where it will end. And that heightens ever more her tragic sense of loyalty to her husband, to marriage and to the idea that goodness will prevail. Shakespeare has lots to say here and lots to heighten for us about the role of women like Desdemona and also that sort of slightly myopic view that she has that blinds her from the reality that she's incredibly vulnerable. Lots for you to think about and lots for you to comment on down below, but please do share with me your thoughts on why Shakespeare characterised her like this and also your interpretation of her particular character and what it could represent more broadly for us as audience members today.